All right. Um, so today's scholarly snippets is on evidence synthesis protocols and why they are important and why they matter. A uh, little bit about me. I am the Systematic Review Services Librarian at the J. Sexter Library at Turo University, Nevada. We have a College of Medicine as well as a College of Health and Human Services. And um, I'm going to turn off, whoops, turn off my um, video just for bandwidth sake, because I know there's been some spotty internet issues. So um, I will come back on towards the end, um, just so we can see faces. So this workshop, our scholarly snippets is meant to help advance research skills and support scholarly activities. At the end of this workshop slash webinar, um, participants should be able to describe what evidence, what an evidence synthesis protocol is, identify three reasons to write a protocol, and name a place to register a systematic review protocol or a scoping review. Whoops. So what is a protocol? And um, a protocol is, some people describe it as a frame or as a recipe. And it's um, basically telling your audience what it what is your research question and why your research question matters that this question um, either has or hasn't been asked before, but why it's important to either revisit it or ask the question. And then after that, it you break down all of the parts of what you're about to do. So oftentimes when we're doing evidence synthesis training at my institution. Um, folks get confused and as soon as the training is over, they're like, I'm ready to screen. I want to run my searches and screen. And I'm like, wait, you got a whole <laughs> step back and um, do some preliminary searching and do some research and then write this protocol. And I often ask teams to write at minimum, the introduction for the protocol before I will even um, start um, developing the search for the project. And then this other image on the side I have as a checklist because there is a Prisma P or Prisma protocol checklist. And that is also um, super helpful to show your team and to for you to familiarize yourself with. So, um, why do protocols matter? And those, these are my three um, main points and key takeaways for why they're so important. They are a roadmap for what your team's about to do. And oftentimes, um, once you're writing and drafting this protocol with the research team, everyone gets on board for what steps happen when, what software is gonna be used and how the process actually will work. And this is um, important for folks that are brand new to doing evidence synthesis, as well as experienced um, um, practitioners in doing this type of um, study. Also, writing that protocol helps avoid bias. So you can't change the research question or change the type of studies you want to include. You um, lay all of that out so everyone is aware of um, what it is that is an inclusion and an exclusion criteria for your research question and for the work you're about to undertake. And then the third reason is the community. Like it's important to put it out there to the research community, either in a registry or also publishing that protocol so that you're letting folks know like we're embarking on this project and you know um, evidence synthesis projects usually take up to a year sometimes much longer depending on the question and how many projects everyone's working on or their time capacity. So it's important to put it out there and then there's time for either collaborators or others that have done reviews on similar topics to reach out and ask questions that might impact how you actually go forward with the review. So the protocol clearly states the purpose of your review. What are you seeking to, to accomplish or answer? What is that review question? Has it been asked before? And what what do you think you're, you're not really saying what you, what answer 
you will find, but you're trying to make it clear what it is you're asking and why that question is important to ask. So you don't want to know too much about your topic, but you don't want to know too little about your topic so that you're not biased in any way. It has a clear documentation of the methods and analyses that you're going to do, any software or tool your team plans to use, if there are uh, limits to, you know, if you're limiting only to English language or if you're going to include any language, if how you would translate if you did have languages other than your research teams familiar with. You want to make sure you prevent any arbitrary decisions by the author team. So once you start screening, there's no chance of someone saying, oh, we should have included this or we should have done this. Like all of that's been piloted and clear to the team. And then once you've registered your protocol, it can facilitate detection of selective reporting. So if another researcher is like, oh, hey, that part of your method seems like it could show some bias, maybe rethink this, or maybe you missed some term in the search or some other synonym for what it is you're researching. And then once it's registered, it reduces an unintended duplication. Perhaps your team didn't find uh, this other existing review or other existing um, protocol that's been published or registered, and it can facilitate that collaboration or um, narrowing in or broadening out on your review question. So how do you write a protocol? So the Prisma P checklist is a guideline. It's not a methodology, but it's a guideline. And it's good to get familiar with what's included in a protocol. And that checklist outlines each of those elements. So you want to make sure you've got all of those elements in your protocol. And then I've linked there the exploration and elaboration article that's also good to familiarize yourself with if you haven't looked at the Prisma P checklist before or you haven't explored Prisma in detail, that article is a good place to just read through, either re-familiarize yourself or initially familiarize yourself. And then Full disclosure, I work at Turo, and we are a JBI-affiliated institution, so I'm very familiar with the JBI methodology and the JBI templates, and so yeah. I lean towards that because that's mostly the types of evidence synthesis that we do and that I participate in, but there are other methodologies, and Cochrane is the gold standard, particularly for intervention and diagnostic accuracy type reviews. Cochrane also works with the Campbell collaboration if you're doing qualitative reviews, which um, haven't come up at my institution, and that's not something I'm um, very trained that I'm trained in or know a lot about. But I want to mention it just in case that's something anyone in the audience wants to explore. Um, so the Cochrane Handbook is a amazing resource. It's I highly recommend. Uh, looking at the handbook, it's definitely um, parts of it may be too, <laughs> too detailed or too much for your review team, particularly chapter four on searching. I'm not sure anyone but a librarian would want to read that chapter, but it's good to get familiar with what's there and knowing what that gold standard is. But the chapter two has a section about protocols, and that's good to show your um, research team, and it can help justify to them if you need to or advocate why writing this protocol is important. And then the JBI manual is um, also online and available as is Cochrane's handbook. And then the JBI protocol templates are available in two places. One is through the JBI software called Summary. Um, if your institution doesn't have this software, it is also available on their journal site, which is the JBI Evidence Synthesis Journal. It's a LWW um, publication. And if you go to the information for authors, they have article types and templates, and you can find those um, templates for different reviews there. So I just have a quick screenshot so you're familiar with the Cochrane training. And the handbook, it's um, fully available. Again, 
online and you'll see this um, chapter two 1.4 is about Cochrane protocols. That's a good place just to get a um, review of the methodology in Cochrane. And then this is a screenshot of that JBI evidence synthesis journal page for um, if you go to four authors, there's a drop down there for information for authors and you'll find this article types and templates. And if you scroll down here, there's links and it will download a Word document. I just um, have a quick screenshot of the one for effectiveness since intervention reviews are the, one of the most common types of evidence synthesis done. So it does give you, um, in this blue italicized text, it gives you some tips for what, what should be in that section. So the Prisma P checklist may not give you as much information on the method. It will, it's really meant to be a guideline of what to include in an abstract, what to include in the protocol, that you would have an introduction, that you would have all the authors identified. So. Uh, we'll go through a couple of the elements in the protocol and what should be there. So this introduction is one of the most important parts. And in the JBI template and in their methodology, it's generally about a thousand words. And for some teams, that's um, a lot. And for other teams, it's they want to write a lot more. But Really, in this introduction, you're describing the rationale for the review in the context of what's already known. And you're explaining to your to your readers what it is you're asking and why it matters. And you also want to explain in that introduction that you've done preliminary searching, that you've done your due diligence, and you know what's out there. So you um, provide an explicit statement of the question of the review. Um, that addresses those PICO elements if it is an intervention review. It could be another framework. If you're doing a scoping review, that framework's the PCC. Another thing I often tell review teams is to think of it like a miniature literature review that they're writing, that it's a thousand word literature review and it, it should have references. I generally advise teams to have around 20 references here so that you're really, you know this topic and you're justifying what it is, as well as um, showing maybe an example of, or two of the type of studies you anticipate finding in the review that you're going to undertake. The next part of the protocol is the methods. And this is really where librarians have the strongest and main role in the writing of the protocol. So here you would have your eligibility criteria. So um, often that limit in the library sense of things would be either maybe a publication date or a language limit, but perhaps it's a human study or an animal study. You would need to you know, discuss that with your team and decide if you want to have any limits there that would impact your searching. Those information sources, I often go over with the team also um, to clarify like what databases we're going to be searching, what other sources, um, what gray literature resources we might look for, and then the search strategy. So usually there's a paragraph describing how you've developed the search strategy, if you plan to have the search strategy pressed, which is that peer review of electronic search strategy. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with that article um, and the method to press a search, but that's something that I highly um, encourage you to do and familiarize yourself with. And then the next portion of the protocol is something depending on the services at your institution and how you work with teams, um, the, you may or may not have a part in the writing of this. I know many librarians don't, and um, we do at my institution. Um, we don't guide it, but we do participate in the discussion of, will there be, how will the data be managed? Um, are you using a screening software? Um, 
what are you extracting data and how are you extracting data in a software? Are you using spreadsheets? How are you blinding? All of those types of things. Um, the selection process, having that clear inclusion exclusion so that when you're at title abstract screening, your team can quickly decide what's an include and exclude. And again, this is the protocol. So nothing has happened yet. You may describe that you're going to pilot this process in the protocol, but you're really just telling your audience and the research community, this is how we plan to undertake things. Similar to that idea of like the recipe. These are the steps of the recipe. You haven't started making the food or gathering all of the information yet. You're just describing what the process is. If there is a data collection process, what data items will be included or excluded. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and then uh, the methods continued. So the what outcome measures, if there are outcome measures that you're looking for, often in a scoping review, you might not identify specific outcomes, but in an intervention review, you may have, you know, a list of outcomes that you're specifically looking for, or your team is specifically looking for. That risk of bias or critical appraisal of individual studies, what, what um, tools will you be using to assess that? How will the data be synthesized? Again, if it's a scoping review, there may not be any data synthesis. You may just be stopping at extraction and then doing a narrative of what kind of information you found. Um, and then um, if there is um, an opportunity to do a meta-analysis and then um, how that will be put together and represented. So, um, some additional elements I didn't mention are that that you would include is the title of your review, the registration, where you've registered it, who the authors are, and if there's any support you received or acknowledgement that you need to make. So um, the registration of your protocol. So before you register, and ideally before you've even started writing, you would have searched for existing systematic reviews, scoping reviews, and other reviews on your topic. Sometimes someone's done something very similar to a systematic review, but it hasn't named it as such. And so you wanna make sure you've looked at, at in the literature and across databases to make sure this doesn't already exist. Prospero is probably the main place um, for a systematic review. They do not take other types of evidence synthesis. They they really only take systematic reviews and they don't take um, studies or systematic reviews that look at animal studies. But it's a great place regardless to search for existing registered um, protocols or systematic reviews. Even if you're doing a scoping review, I still always search Prospero to see if there's anything existing on the topic. Open Science Framework is a great place to register your systematic or your scoping review. I have I find it a little bit hard to search because it's such a um, large repository. So I play around a lot when I'm searching in there, but it, it does have some um, clear uh, guidelines as Prospero does. I think Prospero has about 44 um, text boxes to include information about your review. And then um, JBI does have a title registry. It's not a full registry like Prospero or Open Science Framework. So this is just a screenshot of what Prospero looks like. And um, below the page fold here, you would see a search box where you could search for existing reviews. Again, this is just a uh, OSF screenshot, you'll see I put that orange arrow there where the generalized systematic review registration, this is the registration I also use for scoping reviews with teams. And then this is the JVI um, systematic review register and it's also a good place to check. They, I think there's um, a six month limit. So if you register your title and you don't start it within six months, um, it may not show here. 
And then these are just two places to publish a protocol. There are many, many more places and there are many journals that are um, accepting evidence synthesis protocols um, that I'm finding more and more often. And I know um, some of the researchers at my institution have published in PLOS One, but um, some of the um, uh, specific, like if you're working with PTs or OTs or different allied health, some of those specific journals um, do take protocols as well. So a quick recap of what we talked about is what is an evidence synthesis protocol and what are some of the elements included in there? The three reasons to write a protocol is for that roadmap, getting your everyone on board, preventing bias, and then connecting with the research community, registering your review, if it's a systematic review with Perspero, if it's a scoping review or a systematic review, um, you could also register that with Open Science Framework or OSF. And then I just wanted to mention that there is um, work that's done prior to writing the protocol, a, like a reference interview. When someone comes to the library or comes to your um, team saying they want to do a systematic review or evidence synthesis, there's um, always some time before you even get to the protocol stage and that clarifying and workshopping the question. Sometimes that happens in the library, sometimes it happens out of the library. I just wanted to mention that on MLA Medlib Ed, there is a webinar, um, Margaret Foster and Whitney Townsend um, do this webinar on planning for systematic review success, reference interview and protocol development. That's also a great resource if you're a librarian and you're a member of MLA. And then um, what happens during that process of writing the protocol and after the protocol depends a lot on what the service is at your institution and how the librarian's role is defined. So our my institution, it's much more involved, but it doesn't always end up that way for other folks that I talk to. So that's just good to keep in mind. So thank you for attending, and um, I hope that you have some good takeaways about systematic review and evidence synthesis protocols. Um, I have a few uh, references in the um, from my presentation today, and then um, to share uh, the feedback on today's talk. And then the next upcoming one is Wednesday, November 20th, 930 to 10 on Microsoft Word. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, I did put the link for the survey feedback and for the next, the registration in the chat. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, you want to put them in the chat or uh, potentially unmute? Okay. So Car Caroline asks, have you been on a research team that hasn't published a protocol for a scoping review? If that's the case, did the team create an internal protocol? So I'm thinking, I'm not sure if I know what you mean by an internal protocol, but I'm thinking you mean one not put in a repository that maybe was just developed to get the author team on board. Um, we require if the librarians on the team, we require them to do a protocol. I have had um, teams not publish in a journal, but just register either in Prospero or OSF and then move forward with a review. But I haven't worked with a team that didn't register, if that makes sense. Um, okay, okay, great. Um, then there's, did you uh, do you recommend posting a protocol for rapid reviews as well? I would say um, yes to registering for a rapid review. Publishing the protocol for a rapid review um, might be a little bit um, harder <laughs> because a lot of times journals take a long time to get back. So I think as long as the protocol gets registered in Perspero or in OSF, I, I would recommend doing that for a rapid review. I know you're in a much tighter time frame, but I think it helps the review go more quickly. <laughs> Feels sort of 
ironic to say since it is a rapid review. All right. Um, so next question, is the Cochrane DSR still a good place to find protocols? Um, what is the DSR? Oh, the database of systematic oh, reviews. Oh, systematic reviews. Yes. Yeah. I always look there. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't recognize the acronym. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that is a great place to look. And I, I also look at trials too, just like when I put in my search terms, I check for existing reviews and protocols, as well as any trials that have been registered there since the Cochrane Library calls trials from a couple different places. Mm -hmm. If that's relevant to the question. I mean, it depends on the topic too. <laughs> I got a comment. We just need to get the students on board with the protocol. And I say amen to that. Yes, it is. It's it's sometimes it's challenging to get faculty and researchers on board with the protocol also, especially if they're not as familiar with doing evidence synthesis. But I think once people get familiar with the process, hopefully they'll they'll be on board. I'm I'm advocating for it. <laughs> I support you doing it. <laughs> Great. Um, looks, I don't see any additional questions. Any more questions? If not, we'll wrap this up. I know it goes so fast, oh, these snippets. Oh. <laughs> we do. Um, um, one more question for rapid reviews. If a team doesn't register or publish a protocol, do you think that it would be harder for them to get published in a journal? That's, um, I think it, I mean, it depends on the situation. I, I, I would think it would be harder, but I guess it also is about what um, journal they're hoping to publish in. So um, I think they, they definitely could still get published in a journal without having registered it or published the protocol. But um, I think it depends on the topic and the, the end journal where they want to publish. All right. So, yeah, it is sometimes hard to find journals that will take rapid reviews. I agree with Rebecca. Hopefully that helps anyway. Okay, any last questions? Otherwise, it looks like everyone agrees. You know, thank you, Megan, for the presentation. It was uh, very informative, a lot of information.